After keeping busy with boat chores in Cairns, we decide to take a break and be tourists for a few days, exploring the World Heritage Rainforest around Karanda. Join us as we experience the rainforest canopy from the sky, try some tasty food, teach you a little more about Indigenous plant use, and enjoy a historical and very scenic train ride home. I'm gonna get you to find out I'm gonna get you to find out and know the truth I wanna... Good morning. Today we are heading off to Kuranda, which is up in the rainforest. And then tomorrow we're gonna come back on the scenic railway. So it's gonna be a really great trip. I'm really looking forward to it. Got all the camera gear sorted. In an hour or so we'll be ready to roll on the, on the shuttle bus to the Sky Rail. At last, we've uh, we've reached enough notoriety to get our own gondola. To get our own gondola, no <laughs> one no one wants to ride with us. <laughs> I think this is a really great way to get a good overall look at Cairns. We can actually see all the, the hard water that we sailed down through. Yeah. And the view is much better yeah. from here. <laughs> it is beautiful, isn't it? Well, Cairns is right smack in the middle of a World Heritage area. I mean, there's just a ton of rainforest all around it, all through it. Um, and, you know, I reckon coming on the Sky Rail is just a really great way to see it. I don't, mm. it's, it's not an expensive uh, thing to do. Like I said, I did it with my mum and she loved it. <laughs> And now I'm doing it with Pascal. I'm already loving it. We've it only been on for like five minutes, but it's great. Yeah. Yep. These um I mean you've got you've got these windows where you can you can slide it up and down. Uh, but you can have it open so yeah the, the breeze is coming through, the bird noises and, and everything else like that. So mm. it's really beautiful. Oh. oh my god, we're stopping! <laughs> no. no, that's a good thing. So we've got um, we've got two other stops up here. We're going to jump out, have a look at a boardwalk, and a view over the Barren Falls. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I like how the palms kind of just grow up. Those palms are wait a while. Oh, that's wait a while. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like it's so like a all, vine. All of this all of this uh, what looks like palms is yeah. rattan. Yeah. And that's wait a while, so it climbs up and every time it falls over all those spikes and everything that grab Jagging. you, they jump, they grab a hold of the forest and yeah. then it just keeps climbing its way up into the canopy. Yeah. being on assignment here, Pascal. Not bad. This is Din Din, or the Barren Falls, a 260 metre long granite faced waterfall. We were visiting Cairns in the middle of the dry season, so the falls were just a small trickle. Until 1958, the Barren River was a raging torrent, but since the construction of the Tinaru Dam, the water has been contained for irrigation purposes in the Atherton Tablelands.
Slippers. You said a boat slippers? Oh, they're so soft. Ready for the cold? <laughs> Oh, it's amazing. So, so well done. So uh, envious. Hello, young lady. How are you? <laughs> She's hooked. We got recommended by Paul to have these at the music shop in the markets. Pretty delicious. It's beautiful. Tahini, turmeric, green chili, pickles, salsa. Delicious. Really good. This is an old Douglas DC-3 aircraft designed in America in 1935 as a long-range passenger aircraft. This plane began service with the US Air Force in 1942 in Mariba before being acquired by an Australian airline after the war. It played a role in the movie Sky Pirates, where it was crashed into a section of the reef before being recovered and transported up to its final resting place in Karanda. I'm amazed that here in Australia, you can still find like look, jagged metal edges and stuff without warning signs and stuff all over it. What a place. Look. We're just checking out how tiny the, the space is for the, yeah. the pilot. If you want to be a pilot, it's better off being a manlet, I think. We are at the Karanda Koala Gardens and I have seen many koalas before but I'm sure a lot of you at home haven't seen koalas and you might want to see me cuddling one so. So we're here to kidnap one. We're here to kidnap a koala. He's having an afternoon nap I wish I could have. There's even more. Well, he's koala land. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> this is how I'm used to seeing koalas, like all asleep. Yeah. Koalas only eat eucalyptus leaves, so they spend a lot of their time feeling a bit intoxicated from the um It's the hard to digest. Oil. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. A hop, skip and a jump from the koala park was Bird World, and as soon as we entered, this Indian rig-necked parakeet wasted no time jumping on Troy's head. Oh, he's going for your glasses. What's he chewing now? Your shirt collar. Not ideal. Oh, there we go. 
Ever wondered what Coranda looks like once the last gondola and train has departed? Yeah, so we're going to follow the yellow track, which is the jungle walk, and then we're going to take the river walk, and then we'll be back in town. So, this is the free range sailing tourist edition. Mm -hmm. So we did, uh, we did the, the trip through town yesterday, the obligatory trip, and now we're just having a look um, in the wilder places of Coranda. So it's, it's not all just shopping and markets. You can actually get away and have a bit of a peaceful day away from the madding crowds if you like. Mm -hmm. Should we go and have a look? Let's go. All right, increasingly on some of these um, walks through the Aussie bush, the local councils are starting to put um, more information out there for you, and particularly around the Botanic Garden in Cairns, they have this. So this one says Alexandra Palms, these ones. And it says that the crown was eaten raw or cooked and sheaths could make water containers. And a lot of palms are incredibly useful. So these, you know, it doesn't take much to connect that and you've got a pretty handy little container. Traditionally speaking, I suppose. Um, and these, most palms you can chop down, it'll kill the palm. You can uh, chop this, open this up and the growing tip of a lot of palms is edible. I guess if you're lost in the bush, you could justify it. You wouldn't want to go around killing palms just to get the, because the edible bit's like a sort of a cabbagey flavored um, food just through here, but you've got to kill the whole tree to get, get hold of it. So when you do it with coconuts, um, you know, it used to be called millionaire's salad. <laughs> you destroy a whole coconut tree just to get you know, like this white cabbagey growth that's in the middle. But it's really nice to see, you know, like a lot of that traditional knowledge is being held on. And I think people get a greater appreciation of the bush if they can if they can see that some of it's useful. You know, that's just how humans are sort of programmed, I guess. Look at the basket fern up there. It's amazing. It's all this mass here that looks like a type of palm and uh, these leaves that I'm holding here, they're called lawyer cane. Um, and they've also got the nickname of wait a while. If you look, everything on those things is covered on these backward facing hook like spikes. They're like cat claws. And what happens, and you can see it here, is the way the wild grows up, or the lawyer cane, it grows up to a certain height and then gravity makes it fall into the surrounding rainforest. These spikes catch and then it supports itself and grows up again. And just by, <laughs> by falling and catching, um, it, just, it just keeps working its way up and it can wind its way right up into the top of the canopy. Like really, really long canes going all the way up. Um, it's rattan. Okay, that's all that furniture that you've seen made. Well, that's it. And there was a job in North Queensland of actually putting on heavy leather overcoats, secateurs, machete, and actually going in and harvesting rattan, and that's how you do it. It's not gonna be a fun thing to do. But um, wait a while itself, incredibly useful. All right, these stems can be split, and they're really, really strong. You can make a really strong cord out of it. You've all seen rattan furniture. You can make fish traps, all sorts of things. These backward facing hooks, um, the Aboriginals in North Queensland, you can get a, a tendril, put a little bit of food or bait on there and the freshwater shrimps as they come and get it, ooh, you can hook them out. Just an endless number of uses. When the, when the long strands are going up into the canopy, you can cut the base of it and cut further up and water will drain out of it. There's no end to it really. But you do have to watch out. If you're, if you're going through this thick sort of bush, these things, they get the name wait a while because as soon as they catch your skin or your clothes, you, you're not going anywhere. It's so strong. So you have to wait a while, unhook it, and move on your way. And I guess they also got that name of lawyer cane because <laughs> if you get tangled up with it, you can't get rid of it. You're stuck. <laughs> All right? Um, it takes a while to get untangled from it. So, oh, lawyer cane. It's a bit but, unfair. It's a bit unfair, isn't it, Pascal? <laughs> So even this dead bit of lawyer cane, it's 
you know, it's, it's stuck well in there because all of these tendrils, I mean, they become a bit brittle now that they're dead and rotting, but all of those hooks are really effective uh, at supporting it up, in, up into the canopy. But look at that, it, this thing is just armoured along its length. There's spikes on every part of this plant. <laughs> they're just mad. It looks a little bit like bamboo, but if we see up here on this dead bit, it's, it's solid. It's just made of all these fibres. So lawyer cane actually makes really great and light fish spears, okay, small animal spears and things like that. But you can also bust it apart and the whole thing's made of these fibres which can be teased apart and make incredibly strong rope. Anytime you have like a big tree come down and you know you make a clear space to the sky, the undergrowth just goes mad um, and it just fills up with lawyer cane and everything's just scrambling to fill that space up again. Because a lot of this is regrowth forest, it's not old, it's not old forest, you, it's, it's hard to move through. Like this is the sort of stuff where if you had to go, it'll take you hours to go a kilometre. Um, the people up in New Guinea and stuff that used to have to fight in this, <laughs> it's just unbelievable. It's really, really hard to move through. So when you get old growth rainforest and the canopy's quite complete, you can move through it not too bad. It's, you know, sort of a bit cleared like this. But uh, yeah, this Queensland regrowth bush, really hard work. Wait a while falling over here. Oh no, what happened? <laughs> it's a trap. There you go. Yeah. When I actually first came to Queensland, um, I was just pushing through a bit of this bush and I got caught on my eyebrow by wait a while. That was my introduction to it. Wild gear. So this stuff we were talking about, that gravity, you know, it falls over towards things and then these tendrils grab on and that's how it climbs. So this, this wait a while is doing exactly that. It's just about to catch onto another big creeper and it will just go skyward. So yeah, this stuff, we said that it's a, a good building material. These tendrils, look at that. You make a clove hitch with that thing and that's, it's really good. You can test for whether things are going to make a good um, bush string just by tying a knot in it and pulling on it. I don't have a pocket knife, otherwise I would... What? I don't, yeah, I know. I'd strip this thing of its spikes. I'd show you, but... So if you tie something in an overhand knot and give it a bit of a pull, I'm, I can't do it effectively because I don't want to spike my hands, but that's a good test for whether something will make good cordage for tying stuff up in the bush. Wade Wild definitely passes that test. And if, if you put some effort in and broke this apart into its individual fibres, got rid of those spikes, you could make incredibly good bush rope. But even as it is, you want to make a lean-to or a little shelter, grab some of that stuff, work carefully with it. Unbelievably good. So this is the lacy tree fern, and you can actually eat the fiddlehead, that curling piece inside. That's good bush tucker if you need to get some food. And that's quite common with ferns all around the world. You can eat that centre heart, the new shoots there in the fern. Mm. Yeah. I've never had it myself. I'm not sure how you prepare it. It's not super delicious. Right. So get all the spikes off it um, and boil it. And there's lots of starch in there, but there's a, there's a few if you if you eat a lot of it it's not that great for you right okay but over in New Zealand it was sufficiently important for them to you know they've got ferns and fiddleheads in a lot of the Maori art yep. and also on you know some of their sports teams decorations and things okay yeah so it was an important food over there yep.
So that's a male scrub turkey, and they use those big feet of those. They, they scratch up all the leaf litter into a mound, and just the natural composting of that generates enough heat to hatch their eggs. So the male builds the mound, and the females come along. They're impressed if it's in a good bit of real estate. If he's looking, you know, a bit of a flash character, nice red head, yellow wattle, all the things that scrub turkey females like. She'll lay the eggs in there, and then she'll just tear off and go and have the fat time. He raises the kids, and he might, uh, he might actually get a few females to lay eggs in his nest if he's a successful sort of chook. So this one looks like he's just starting to put his mound together. Nice young scrub turkey, just making a name for himself. Here we see a native beehive. If you look closely, you can see some of the pollen sacs attached to the bees' back legs. You can also see some of the bees removing waste from the hive. Australian native bees are much smaller than European bees and they don't sting, they bite. Native bee honey was a traditional source of food for Aboriginal people in Australia. So you can see a lot of the trees have creepers that go up and around them to reach the canopy. This one's shed its uh, creeper, it's gone now. But you can see that it was sufficiently strong that as the tree grew, it had to grow around the creeper. It constricted it very strongly. You know, they're tough plants. So we don't see it on the time scale that we move on, but plants fight, you know, they, they have to compete for space with each other. It's, it, it happens slowly, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a battle out here. Alright, a lot of these trees that live in soft and shifting soils have developed the strategy of having buttress roots. These are buttress roots, okay, they've, they've grown them up and they've made a triangular section. And that happens like at the point of most leverage, they have a great amount of strength. It's very hard to uproot these trees. But from a human point of view, this actual graceful curve that follows it really good spot to get axe handles and other tools and things like that and the aboriginals also if you get a nice tight curve great for getting a throwing stick or a boomerang this is a black bean um, a really really common tree all through north queensland and it has these massive seeds in these little pods because they were so common um, the local aboriginals devised a way of eating it but it's involved. These are highly toxic as they are right now so they need to be smashed up almost into a paste and then put in running water and leach them over days <laughs> and then grind that up, dry it out and make a type of flour and eat it as a, a damper. So what does it say here? The seeds are toxic but can be eaten after three days preparation including leaching in water. So it's heat, it's washing, it's everything. But I guess there's so many of them that it's worth their while spending days and days and days just trying to get the poison out of them. Well, that's a fair old feed, I guess. This is the walk. It's a pretty nice walk. How are you feeling, Pascal? Good. I'm a bit hungry. A bit hungry? <laughs> we actually had a little few drinks last night so I'm, I feel like someone that's drunk a, a bit, bit of rum over. last night <laughs> so <laughs> low key but that's it the walk was really nice really peaceful there wasn't too many people on it mm. um, and now we're just going up here past the railway station back into town yes everybody Okay, what's yeah. this one here? Is that the soil That's one? A, no, this is a savory one. Ah. We have a skiapi noodles, vermicelli noodles. Ah, okay. And the veggies, they're cooked in a lard with soy sauce. Okay. And they give nice. Okay, so we'll get one of those. Yes. And then some sweet ones. Yes. Just a moment. I'll wrap it up. Where are from Japan? I come from Yamaguchi Ken, which is a mix to Hiroshima, ah. where the bomb went. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I was born just after the bomb. Bomb. Yeah. Which one would you like? Uh, salt powder or cinnamon sugar or oil sugar? Uh, 
Um, I think we'll have one soybean and one cinnamon. Okay. Up here. Where? Oh yes. When you are small, you don't see. Them. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. You bake them here? Yes! That's everything. Oh, okay. We'll eat that now. So yep. So this Thank is the donut. This is the one for you. And this is the $10 for Tojo. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you. I hope you have a lovely time. Thank you. Thank you. Video man san, arigatou gozaimashita. Try it. It's weird, but it's good. Yeah, Japanese. Konnichiwa. Konsin I haven't had anything like it before. No. The Karanda Scenic Railway is hauled by 1720 class diesel electric locomotives, each emitting around 1,000 horsepower. Coal-fired steam engines ceased operation on the line in 1967. Construction of the Karanda Railway started in 1886. During the wet season, the roads from the coast to the Atherton Tablelands became boggy and were impassable to deliver supplies, and the tin miners were on the verge of famine. The railway was built to deliver these much needed supplies and was completed in 1891. Many workers lost their lives during the construction of this railway in some of the most treacherously steep and wet country in Australia. The locomotives have been hand painted by the traditional owners of the region, the Jabagai, to depict the dreamtime legend of the Buddhaji, a great carpet snake who carved out the mighty Barren Gorge. The railway line from Karanda to Cairns has 15 tunnels. All tunnels were dug with picks and shovels after dynamite or gunpowder was used to loosen the rock. The longest tunnel on the line is 429 metres long, and a total of around 2.8 million cubic metres of earth was moved by hand during the construction of the line. The railway line is also made up of 55 bridges over the gorges, creeks and ravines. These bridges, like the tunnels, were all built by hand, a truly astonishing feat of resilience and manpower. Thank you for tuning into Free Range Sailing. 
If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like as it really helps get our video out to more viewers. If you'd like to keep track of us in real time, there is links in the description to our Facebook and Instagram page, as well as loads of other great information that you might find useful.